I'm Father Robert Lawton, president of Loyola Marymount University, a university proud and fortunate to be in Los Angeles. I've been lucky enough to live much of my life in great world cities. I grew up on the East Coast, lived in Washington, New York, Boston. Then I moved to Europe, lived in Munich and Berlin, Florence and Rome. All these are great world cities, but they're old as great world cities. And I used to think sometimes when I was in them, what would it have been like to live in one of these cities when it was in its youth? as a great world city. Well, now I get that chance. Los Angeles is a great world city, arguably the great world city, and yet it's in its youth, or maybe in its adolescence, full of optimism and energy and hope and great spirit. And so in studying this great and wonderful city, we're studying not only the city itself, but the modern world, because that's what great cities do. They live very intensely, the modern world, and in a city like Los Angeles, uh, it also lives the future as well. The future feels closer in Los Angeles than anywhere else. So this urban lecture series studies the city, but it studies our world, it studies our future. I hope that you enjoy today's lecture. Okay, welcome to the urban lecture series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University, also co-sponsored by LA36. Um, and we welcome all our students here and those of you who are watching us on television. Today we're going to talk about health, uh, one of those issues that impacts every single person and every single person has an opinion. And uh, so we will share uh, multiple opinions up here even though there's only three of us. So um, we have some uh, great guests today. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Abby Land. And she is the co-CEO of the Saiban Free Clinic, formerly the Los Angeles Free Clinic. It is the oldest continuously operating free clinic in the nation. The Saban Free Clinic provides free medical and dental care, counseling, HIV testing, health education, prenatal care, and wellness programs for thousands of uninsured each year. Um, in addition, uh, Abby Land is a public servant. She has served on the uh, West Hollywood City Council, and I believe next week you're going to become the mayor of West Hollywood. Yes, I will. Uh, and uh, took a little bit of time off and had previously served uh, before, and uh, we're going to ask her a little bit about West Hollywood politics since we have her here. Um, let me also introduce um, Herb Schultz. And he has a very unique and successful career straddling the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, and we're going to talk about all of those. But he specifically, one of the reasons we invited him here is because he served as the governor's senior health policy advisor. And he's uh, been very involved in how the state and government deals with uh, health care. I have provided, for those of you who are in the room, a lengthy uh, bio on both of these individuals. Um, which some of it will be, we're going to put it on the final exam and see how they talk about you guys. So, um, so all that information is in, in, in your packet because I, I, I could spend five minutes on each one of these individuals. But first, let, let me talk to uh, uh, Abby. West Hollywood, not Hollywood, not North Hollywood, but why is West Hollywood its own city but Hollywood isn't? And where is North Hollywood? Okay, good questions. We need a map. Uh, West Hollywood actually is celebrating uh, this year its 25th anniversary of becoming a city. And we were unincorporated county between Hollywood and Beverly Hills. North Hollywood is over the hill in the valley. Uh, and that's actually part of Los Angeles as well. So we're our own separate city. And we became a city 25 years ago for wanting to have local control and it was really the issue of housing that brought together a coalition of folks to fight uh, to keep affordable, our housing affordable and most specifically to ensure that as a city we were able to continue to have rent control because at that time the county was saying maybe we wouldn't have rent control and there's many renters in West Hollywood, we're about 37,000 people and 80% are renters and many folks are seniors living on fixed income still. And so affordable housing was certainly a driving force for, for that incorporation. Um, what is West Hollywood known for? Maybe I should ask the students what West Hollywood is known for. I think we are known for being a city that is incredibly creative. 
We're like the little engine that could, but we do. We're known for our stances on LGBT issues. We're known for our stances on women's rights. We're known for our stances uh, against gun control, pro-environment. We're known for being a very progressive city, and I hope that we're known as a city that really has a heart because we really care about the people in our community. What prompted you to run for uh, council? What prompted me? Um, I was involved in the cityhood campaign. I was on the first planning commission. And when there was an opening, I thought, you know, being on council, I'd have the ultimate say as how West Hollywood would be. And so I, I love my community. You know, that sounds sort of corny, but I loved West Hollywood then. It was my home. And I just felt I wanted to stay special. And hopefully, my leadership will help it happened and that's why I went. And did you run for any other public office? I have. And what I, happened there? I didn't win. <laughs> I ran for a state assembly and I... I what um, year was that? I've run actually twice. I ran in the 90s and 94 and then I ran recently uh, in 2006. Uh, so who won in 94? In 94, Wally Knox okay. uh, ran, won and served on the assembly and uh, recently has been working in Los Angeles uh, in well, I think he just got a new job um, working at the airport, I think. Uh, uh -huh. But, uh, and he's great. And then uh, this time Mike Fuhrer ran, and uh, he won. Mm -hmm. And Mike is up in the legislature now and doing good work. Right. Really uh, been Mike's a great uh, voice on transportation issues, on housing. Huh? And billboards, which, thank goodness, we have his voice up there. He's a former Los Angeles City Council member. Yes, he so. is. Yes. Now, there, uh, has anyone from West Hollywood ever been able to get elected to the state legislature? Yes, believe it or not, we mm -hmm. have, uh, <laughs> even if I wasn't successful. But uh, Paul Koretz, who uh, was an assembly person representing the 42nd, he was very oh, successful. Actually, he was in between the people you just talked to. He replaced Wally Knox, yes, and did. then he was replaced by Mike Fuhrer. And now he's actually running to represent the 5th Council District in Los Angeles. He lives... Uh, I thought you said West Hollywood wasn't in the city of Los Angeles. It's not. Well, Paul doesn't live in West Hollywood anymore. He moved uh. um, out. But it's an area that he represented uh, very well as, a, as an assembly person. And so... Yeah, interestingly uh, enough, and I'll do this because I'm only here ahead, 10 years, yeah. but uh, Paul moved down the street, which made him a Los Angeles city resident instead of West Hollywood and Mike Fewer moved across the street to move from the 5th Council District which he used to represent to the 42nd Assembly District so they're really trying to do this <laughs> about six years apart so is that the definition of a carpetbagger I would say no in this case because Come on. no uh, no no I'd say no in this case because Mike represented well, explain, what, explain what a carpetbagger is well, a carpet bagger is someone who specifically takes a big suitcase, a carpet bag, and moves into a place kind of at the spur of the moment, if you will, to run for an office. And some people do that. But this, I have to agree with uh, Herb. The, for instance, the 5th Council District, mm -hmm. where Mike served, lots of the 42nd Assembly District was in there. And it's just by a quirk of fate that his house was not in the 42nd. But when he moved, it was like the same people. And I have to say the same for Paul. Uh, though he lived in West Hollywood, West Hollywood's part of the uh, 42nd, but a lot of the 5th Council District was part of that as well. So when he moved, he really understands, as Mike does, the, the needs of, of those folks. So and West Hollywood's 1.9 square miles, so. But it's an important 1.9 square miles. So, Herb, you have dealt with a lot of politicians, uh, especially up in Sacramento, regarding uh, um, obviously health issues. I supported Abby in 2006. <laughs> What's he going to say? We're on TV. You're right next to him. I did. Like, I, I, I did. It's like did. Right, right before and, I... And, and Mike Fuhr, who I have supported since he won in the general and in the last yeah, election. Yeah, that's like me asking my students who their favorite professor is right about a midterm time. It's like... This guy, yeah. huh? Yeah. Even, then, even then, it's uh, not much of a He's doing a response. great job, and Abby's going to do another great job as mayor. And I'm a West Hollywood constituent. I've always voted for Abby since I've lived okay, there. Okay, well, not talking about those. Okay. okay. Yeah, talking in, in generic terms. Yes, all sir. Right. Um, we talk about education. We talk about housing and all that. In the priority of Sacramento legislators, where does health fall into? 
Uh, I think in terms of Sacramento legislators and indeed in fact the governor, you know, now is the governor's senior advisor, not just working on health, but specifically about health, very high, very, very high up uh, on the list. What percent of the budget in, from Sacramento is health related? Well, I, I answer it in a little bit of a different way. It's, it's sort of like what percentage of the budget isn't health. Um, the governor and the legislature only really get if you will, sort of control or oversight over about 15% of the budget. Most of the money is already spent by federal formulas, by those of you that are 18, and I'm sure all of you are, um, that vote, you know, have done various initiatives and propositions that have pre-said, okay, here's $10 billion for a high-speed rail like we just did. So the only, um, if you will, sort of areas of our budget where our state tax dollars are what gets divided to pay for those services is health, is education, and is corrections, law enforcement, public safety. So there is always a dynamic debate every year in the budget about wh who gets more money and for what programs, health, education, and that. And those three of them are only about 15%. Explain to the students and the viewers the um, relationship between the state and the counties and the role that the counties play in health. Um, very, very, very integral um, for, I think, two probable reasons to do it. I mean, the state government, you know, runs the Medi-Cal program, Medicaid, in the rest of the country, pretty much, um, which is really a program mostly for uh, low-income folks, a lot of, of pregnant women, women, um, and at some level, sometimes you can get childless adults in there, but it's predominantly a program for, for lower income. Uh, individuals and largely, as I said, women uh, and children. Counties have a very, very special role, and that is that the counties have to take care of, quote unquote, the indigent. So not just low income, but people with very, very little or no incomes. And so there's a lot of, if you will, sort of money streams that come in to the state that go right to the county, and there's other things that come in for the county that go to the state. So it can get very complex. But you have to have the state and the local governments working very closely uh, together. And we have obviously, and one of the interesting things about your background is that you stra straddle that. We, we think about uh, health and health providers. There's the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. And you've dealt with all of those. You actually represented uh, uh, in the public, excuse me, in the private sector, uh, some large companies. Talk a little bit about what you did in that, in that capacity. In, in just the private or in all of just them? Just in the private. Um, in the private sector, sort of two things in the past. One is I spent about 10 years in, I'll, I'll wait for the hisses, um, about 10 years in the managed care industry, but I actually went into it in 1989 because I was sort of part of a political philosophy that the Democrats, I think, had and still have about a focus on prevention, wellness, the fact that you can actually prevent chronic disease. And so I spent 10 years in the industry um, when it was then just HMOs and most of the world only knew Kaiser, which we know out here, and a few other health plans. And so I lobbied at the federal level um, in Washington and then came out here and lobbied for a couple of years, you know, at the state well, level. You'll basically work for anybody. You, you, you work for the private sector, the public sector, nonprofit. You've worked for Republicans. You work for Democrats. You've worked in Sacramento. You've worked in D.C. You worked in, uh, in the L.A. area. It's like, uh, what, I can't keep a job. Yeah, it sounds like you can't keep a job. So, but talk a little bit about AIDS Project LA, which was your, some of your nonprofit work, and then okay. I'm going to go back to talk um, about the free that, clinic. That, I think, and, and not that I didn't appreciate and, and enjoy the managed care industry, I, I, I did and I do, and I think that managed care done right is a wonderful delivery system, especially for people with chronic health conditions. Um, but for me, I've always been sort of, I was a, a democratic political activist from the time, quite frankly, when I was about 10 in Philadelphia. And I went to college and was this sort of democratic activist in college, um, dealt with sort of an issue in my life and became a gay democratic activist. And later on became an HIV positive gay democratic activist. But as a part of that, I was always someone who liked bringing sort of people together. And I have my own views, but my own views are sort of very consistent and sometimes things evolve. And so because I was a lobbyist, I really wanted to learn about what every side of the sort of political world was. And I was fortunate enough to know that where my values were, these jobs 
sort of lined up with that. In, you know, in 1989, in the HMO industry, Democrats loved HMOs, promise of prevention, wellness, health promotion. By the mid-90s, right, Democrats said, no way in hell, it's not saving enough money, and you're not talking about quality of care, you're talking about cost, 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 cost. And Republicans originally thought that the HMOs were socialized medicine. And later on, they came in to see it more positively. So um, I came out here 10 years ago because I had reached the pinnacle of my career. I was the top lobbyist for the managed care industry nationally, the head of state government affairs for what's now the American Health Insurance Plans, largest trade association representing 200 million people in managed care and insurance plans across the country. But something was missing for me, and that something was, I was HIV positive. I thought there was not enough activism and advocacy around the issues, and I was fortunate enough to get involved and moved out to California. Well, talk about AIDS Project LA. What is, what is its role? What, is it, what has it been doing? Um, second largest AIDS service organization in the country, and APLA basically provides social support services to people living with HIV AIDS, uh, mental health, um, housing, uh, dental services, alcoholism and drugs, community-based care, um, transportation, um, you name it, it's there. And so it works in coordination with other groups like the Gay and Lesbian Center, which have medical providers as well, but it is there and has thousands of clients across the county of Los Angeles to try and basically, if you will, for anyone uh, infected or affected by HIV AIDS. And Abby, going back to you, the Savant Free Clinic, we, I mean, I always known it as the LA Free Clinic. What does it do and where did it get that name? Um, well, we started in 1967 as just a little storefront run by volunteers to deal with uh, what were called hippies up on Sunset Strip, love children, uh, folks who were enjoying music and good times and kind of taking lots of trips, but they never left the ground. And um, we had some volunteers who wanted to get together and make sure that these kids had um, access to medical care and access to you know, um, services for family planning and, you know, to keep them safe. And we started there with the mission that we would try to meet the needs of folks in, in uh, the area. And, you know, 42 years later, we have four different clinics. We provide services to people of all ages. And though we certainly still do the family planning and the uh, STD services, we have comprehensive primary care. Uh, kind of the same care you would get at your doctor's office. People come to us. We're a medical home. We're managing people's diabetes, hypertension. Uh, we have incredible prenatal program that we do in partnership with Cedars. We see adolescent medicine with uh, Children's Hospital and see a lot of youth, a lot of homeless youth, and, um, you know, do also a lot of prevention and education. We started as the Los Angeles Free Clinic, and we were very lucky that last year a couple... Cheryl and Heim Saban made an incredible endowment to our clinic. And Cheryl Saban, before she was Cheryl Saban, was a s divorced mom who actually worked not too far from the clinic. She had a couple of kids, and she just wasn't feeling well. And she kind of always figured out how to pay for stuff for her kids, but there was never any left over for her with her job and, and everything. And one day, she just felt really bad, and she came to the clinic, and you know, she had this connotation of what a free clinic would be, and she was kind of embarrassed and didn't want to come in. But when she tells the story, she says, you know, she came in, and it wasn't the way you would think. It was like going to the doctor's office, and people were respectful. She got great care and felt better, and fast forward uh, all those years later when she was in a much different uh, economic spot, she and her husband uh, made a $10 million endowment to us last year. And so in honor of that, we uh, renamed the clinic the Saban Free Clinic to acknowledge them and thank I'll them. I'll rename my center if uh, you can <laughs> uh. but it's, it's I'm been, not sure it fits in there. I, I don't care. I'll but I money. have to say it's been, a, <laughs> it's been really great for a, a free clinic, for a clinic, really, any community clinic to get a $10 million gift. I think it says a lot about the fact that clinics provide critical services. We are the safety net here in Los Angeles County and certainly in many counties. Without clinics like ours and others, 
people would go without needed health care because the county can't take care of everybody. And be, I want to expand on that, but before that, just tell the students who Savan is and where he made his money, <laughs> um, Power Rangers and all that. That's it, you know. So uh, he is a, a very smart man and uh, started that little thing called Power Rangers. And he was probably growing up, you saw those. Yeah, yeah and has built I it. I know into Joe had a uh, costume. He still kind of wears it, wears <laughs> it to class every once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, we thank you. <laughs> that helped build that fortune for him. So, uh, and he recently bought the uh, Univision Network, and yes, so it's a yeah. very big and guy. Then that fortune is with a B, and yeah. it's very. They were very, very. They're very philanthropic. philanthropic. Right. Very, very philanthropic. And in fact, um, Cheryl um, has a new book coming out um, beginning of May called about self worth, about women and their self worth, and she's an incredibly bright, articulate woman who truly has been on one side and on the other yeah. and truly appreciates that and knows kind of the story that goes along with that and, and how challenging it is to, to kind of turn your life around. So let's focus on health care in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. Let's use that as a unit of analysis and in terms of what grade would you give uh, health care irrespective of what criteria you use and then what, what do you think are the major challenges? I know these are very broad questions, but let's begin with that and then uh, and, and get a response from both of you on that and then go to uh, how do we meet some of these uh, um, challenges and obstacles. Abby? Well, you know, it's kind of hard to just give it a grade because I, I think it depends what you're grading. I think if you're grading, like, our clinic, A+. Plus. Uh, and I think I could say many of the states. That sounds like grades. all my students. Yeah, I don't know how you're going to grade everybody else, but I get an A+. Plus. Exactly. So. But we do. We deliver quality care. Sounds like my students. We, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. Keep pushing. Yeah. Uh, but really, we deliver quality care under extraordinary circumstances. And so A+. Plus. But if you're talking about kind of access for people, I think as a county, it's not not very good. There's not enough providers, there's not enough clinics, there's not enough places at the county. So, you know, we're looking, and especially now, uh, especially now, our clinic that used to average about 100, 150 new calls a week last year at this time, we're getting 500 calls a week of people that need services. So we're like, at a, you know, the county system as a whole regarding access, try as it might, is overwhelmed. So it's kind of a D. Uh, so it's hard to, I think, grade it overall in that sense I well I, I mean I'll, I'll I'll take a similar path but sort of evade sort of giving it a grade by saying this I don't think there's any doubt at the county level at the state level at the federal level at the city level that our health care system is broken and there are many 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 reasons for that but when you look at everything and you look at the debate that we just went through uh, in California on health care reform coming closer than any state or federally one vote away from universal coverage in this state in late 2007 it demonstrates that the problems of California are the same as the problems in Wyoming are the same in the problems in in Maine and that is you know rising premiums that is lack of primary care doctors that is cost of new technology drugs and um, you know hospital so systems. List those again for the students because that's very important because those are the major driving costs. List those one more time. Sure. Um, major driving costs have a lot to do with many many different things. Um, the cost of new technology is a huge driver in the increase of healthcare costs. Um, new technology so whether it's CAT scans, PET scans, um, certain types of, of treatments that could be cancer type treatments it's just the cost of new technology puts a significant um, well uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals. When you stop and you look at, and I understand when the pharmaceutical industry says it takes us a billion dollars over a 10 year period to produce, you know, one of the drugs that I take every day being HIV positive. But at the end of the day, you sort of have to look at it and say, okay, but if your profits are $18 billion and our system is too expensive and X number of people are not insured, that's a problem. Drug costs are a lot hospital costs are going up tremendously because the only people that pay what we call full build charges in other words pay are, are asked to pay exactly what it costs in a hospital are people who come into an emergency room that cannot pay and so what ends up happening is those of us that are insured it's called the hidden tax the cost gets socialized, so we pay for everybody that doesn't have coverage, basically, 
and then the hospital is millions upon millions of dollars in debt. That's why you see hospitals closing, emergency rooms. Add all of that up and a lot of other stuff, that's why the system's broken. The costs are too high, and we have not done anything nationally. Uh, we've tried at the state level, trying at the local level, to, um, if you will, um, make the delivery system and make it work. But it's broken and severely broken. And what I know that the uh, what is Obama doing? A couple uh, just last week, and there were these different uh, um, uh, groups that got together, including here in California, Schwarzenegger, and I think the yeah. governor of um, Washington, Washington State, came, State right. came down. And what is that all about? What's going on? With okay. That? Well, I'll answer two. One is at the federal level, we have a president, and this is not a partisan issue. I just want to say that for one minute because you know I've disclosed that I'm a Democrat working in the Schwarzenegger administration, but I think what that has shown that with doesn't help Republicans. this governor. They, they're like... <laughs> you what? That doesn't help Republicans. They don't think Schwarzenegger is a Republican either. We can so. get into that discussion as well. I want to ask you to raise your hand sometimes I do about who's who and what's what, but All you don't right, need to do that. It's, 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 it's not a partisan issue. It's not a partisan issue. And so there are some people who try and make it that, but it's not. But we do have a president of the United States who seems to have a very strong commitment and I think believes has a strong commitment to universal coverage as does this governor. And the important thing is that universal coverage is not, I'm not saying government run health insurance. You may be in support of what we call single payer government run. What we're saying is the notion of everybody in the state, everybody in this country having insurance. And so uh, having access to that insurance and quite frankly a lot more, but trying to fix that delivery system. Um, the president had a forum about a month and a half ago in Washington where he brought all of the stakeholders together. So consumers, labor, providers like doctors, hospitals, nurses, health plans, and business, small, medium, and large. And he brought all of them together to say, I want to do health care reform this year. Here's my eight principles around reform. Now let's get to the work Congress, let's get to the work people. And so as a part of taking this out to the people, I don't know, were any one of you sort of volunteers on, on one of the campaigns or on the Obama campaign? Okay, well, those of you that were volunteers know that they had a lot of house parties, healthcare house parties, things like that. So the president asked our governor and the governor of Washington to hold a regional forum. So they did five regional forums and last Monday we were privileged to do the one at the California Endowment downtown, the Western Regional White House Forum. And so it was two governors, it was Melody Barnes who's the president's chief domestic policy advisor and I had the privilege of being the point person for my boss on putting that whole thing together. And I've been saying to people, I've been waiting eight years to have somebody say to me, the White House is on the other line. And now I wanted to say over that four week period, stop calling me, stop calling me. Because, <laughs> you know, you take an Arnold Schwarzenegger and how much it took to do health care reform with Arnold Schwarzenegger and then add the White House on top of that. And that's a lot of energy. Um, but that's what's happening is that we are looking at the prospect and of federal reform. Is, is, and there state a website, reform. is there a website associated with that, that effort? There are. So you can go on the governor's website, which is www.ca. I'm sorry, dot gov, g o v, dot c a, dot g o v. So gov, like governor, dot c a, state of California, dot gov. Or you can go on the national site, www.healthreform.gov, which is the federal site. But there is the 90-minute forum is actually covered uh, on that, and you can actually watch it. And then there's a webinar after it that I moderated. So what's the what's the next? I ask better questions. I think that, you know, I have to say, I think it is so incredibly exciting that, that the, there is a national discussion about this and that we have this president that is truly committed to making something happen. Uh, and I think... But what's the likelihood that we're going to see something? I think we're going to see Given the political something. obstacles, yeah. the... I actually, th I don't think we're going to see the whole kit and caboodle solved, you know, in this, in this uh, next period of time. But I do think we will see some changes occur because there is really on both sides of the aisle, the people that those aisles represent, people are really suffering. You know, the cost is outrageous. And people who had always had insurance don't have it now, uh, can't afford it. You're seeing families without it. So there is, I think, a groundswell of people that want to see change. Everyone might not like what comes, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a chance to take a first step. 
And we all should be, and I think that's why the president asked the governor, his voice and his advocacy for health care reform, we came one vote away in late 2007, January of 2008, to get universal coverage in California. When and everybody how, how, what would that plan have been? What are the particulars of that plan? Basically three broad principles. A focus on health promotion and wellness. Everybody covered, meaning universal coverage, with significant cost containment and affordability. I mean, you can't just, you, you can't just cover in this state, 5.1 million people who are uninsured when you have a system that's not working and people are dropping off the rolls because they can't afford it. So you not only have to do significant things to take the cost of the system down, but you also have to provide subsidies for low-income people, tax credits for moderate-income people. You have to incentivize personal responsibility in terms of how people, you know, sort of prevent or manage illnesses that they have. And you also have to really, really, really make sure um, that you are able to wrap it all together and put it into the getting everybody coverage to sort of bring down that overall cost. So those three, th those three points. So let me ask you, Herb, what can the city of Los Angeles and the mayor, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, do? And then Abby, what can the city of West Hollywood do in the, on these issues? Is there any, is there anything that they can do? Um, I, I think there's um, uh, a lot that cities can do. Um, I went two years ago when we started this out, and I did 1,400 meetings across the state on behalf How of the meetings? governor. 1,400. Um, the whole team did 2,000. The governor went up and down every part of this state. Um, and, you know, sometimes I was with him, sometimes I wasn't. Um, but it is true that this state, this county, these cities are crying out for reform. And I went because I asked to go talk with the League of Cities, which is the trade association, you know, for the cities. And they happened to be having a board meeting here. It was the California League of Cities. And I had a lot of questions from their staff. Well, what, why should cities care? It's, you know, the counties pay for health care, so we know you're, you're going to talk to the counties. And I would just look at these people and say, well, let me think about this. Let's see, you've got hospitals in your cities that are closing down. You've got uh, doctors that are living in your cities and nurses. You've got businesses that are going bankrupt because of the cost of health care. But cities don't have any regulatory power. They don't have any budget for health. Most cities don't even have departments of okay, health. But, it, but it's the counties that, that right. do but let that. Me, yeah, but let me finish and then hand it over to Abby. Some cities do, like Long Beach. Long Beach that's, has its own health. That's well, a very rare exception. Within LA, yeah, in Pasadena, but within LA County, that is absolutely true. But think about how much health care and the whole issue of whether you have coverage or not, how it affects the economics and the economy of a city. If a emergency room or a hospital closes, right? And we've had a lot and of And people those. are out of work and collecting unemployment and they are in your community and they are not working and they are not paying taxes. It's not just a county no, level I, I issue. I agree, but what specifically in the formal role mm -hmm. can a city do? I mean, in, in terms of that. I mean, I, you're, I, you're, in, you're, in that form, you're in that formal role. You're a council member. Right. And you so, have no formal mm -hmm. jurisdiction over health care at all. Correct. Okay? Yet, you know, you see the, obviously the issues given you what you're in. You know, what can you do? I think there's a number of things that, that cities can do. First of all, you're right, we're not going to start providing health care, especially a small city like, like ours. But first, we can be strong advocates right. because at the end of the day, it's about getting the votes for the health care reform. And so it's about cities providing education to their, to their citizens so they understand what's at stake. So we can, do, we can be strong advocates not only as electeds but educating our constituents. I also think, and, and raise the awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we can do is in our city, though we do not provide health care per se, we contract with a number of social service providers to help ensure that our citizens are staying healthy if possible. We help fund APLA. We, uh, fund, um, we fund the, the free clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, to provide health care. We fund other agencies to provide social services to try to help people. We also, as a city, I feel, you know, trying to do the things we can do. So I focus a lot on wellness activities because I think one of the travesties of our health care system is that it's designed in a way 
to pay when you're sick. You know, when you get into the hospital and God forbid you're having something wrong, then the hospital might be able to bill the insurance company or bill Medi-Cal or something. But, you know, for those regular just preventative visits and health education, no one's paying for that most of the time. And, and, and the system's not geared that way. It is one of the things in uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's plan that, that I did like, which was there was a huge component about how do we stay healthy and what do we need to do in that, that it's like I'm responsible. So at the city level, we um, have instituted wellness walks and, and we have three courses around the city and you know we talk about health, um, heart health and breast health and prostate health and you know we do a lot of education to help our constituents stay healthy and then we work in partnership with the county whenever possible because it is the county that is our provider. Well the county is the delivery system but one point that I think if, if you're going to take anything out of this health care reform is not just about the delivery system. It is not just about access to insurance. We don't have enough primary care doctors. So even if you have an insurance card, you're not always going to get access to a doctor in today's system. You may be able to get one at the free clinic, or you may be able to get a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner at these new retail clinics that have sprouted up, or you may not but it is also about better health. And better health means walking, it means exercising, it means bike paths, it means city planning and, and county planning in terms of you know, sort of where you're living, environmental health. And so it's important that all those factors fit into well, it. Health more broadly defined. Exactly. You can, you can as, as council members, you're the ones who are determining the city planning and what your city is going to look like. So when you're approving de developments, you want to approve developments and see, can you get the bike path there? Do you have enough space for um, you know, green space in, in your parks? Do you have exercise equipment? So it's really looking at how do you make your city livable, sustainable, and healthy. Right. How many bike line lanes can you have? Because I now have a scooter, so don't come to West Hollywood if you don't want to be run over. But I'm trying to learn how to use it. But bike lanes. And West Hollywood has a lot. I'm serious. I don't do it very well. Um, so, so Abby will stay away from that side of the street. One thing that Note. you were asking as a part of that, why are we so, so um, confident and so positive about the notion of uh, federal health care reform? The president in his budget last month came out, or I guess in February now, came out with eight broad principles for health care reform. There is very little difference between what the president is saying and what the governor and Fabian Nunez the then speaker that did a bipartisan package of reforms, it is very, very, very and similar. And eight principles are on that website. And those eight principles are also on that website. But when you sort of look at it and go through, there's an amazing amount of commonality, maybe not on every detail, but what we learned in the California debate and what, you know, this governor is trying to pass on um, uh, to the federal government, to the president, who've been seeking his counsel and now the people, you know, all around counsel, um, is that the broad goals have to be shared. There might be different ways to accomplish a goal, but everybody's not going to get what the governor said at the forum last week is you're not going to hit a 10. You're going to hit a 7. And so the federal government needs to think about share the broad goals and then come to the middle and start sort of, if you will, melding and be creative with where your philosophy is. If there was one reform that you could just swing a magic wand, what reform would you like to see implemented, Herb? Um, I, well, they're, they're coupled. No, one. <laughs> well, they're coupled. And I'll explain why. One. Okay. He's not a very good student. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you know. Um, I think, for me, the biggest is what we call guaranteed issue. What Guaran that means... How, how many of you have heard of guaranteed issue? And I'm now going to explain it in, in, real, in plain language. Yeah. What that means is today, if you go out and try and get individual health insurance, not tied to your job, employer-based insurance or group insurance, but you go out to get individual insurance. Our state, most states, our country, allows a, an insurance company or a health plan to cherry pick you. If you've had childhood asthma, if you have HIV, if you've had breast cancer but you're cured, you either, one, likely to get turned down for insurance. If you are not turned down for insurance, 
the price that they want to charge you for insurance can likely put it out of your range or you can get it and become bankrupt. Half of all bankruptcies in this country, half of all personal bankruptcies, bankruptcies in this country are because of health care costs. And so what guaranteed issue means is you cannot be turned down for insurance because of your age or your medical history. I have talked to parents across the state whose children have had childhood asthma, you know, who have had something that they don't have any longer or fought some disease and it's on, you know, their record and then cannot get health insurance. That's another reason healthcare is so happy, is, is so, uh, costs so much. The reason I'm going to mention the other one is just because you can't make insurance, you can't say, okay, everybody has to be in the pool without requiring everybody to have insurance. It's a, it's, it, they, they go together. Can I explain that a little bit more? Okay. In the governor's plan, the governor said, similar to car insurance, not the greatest analogy, uh, but similar to car insurance, everybody in the state must have health insurance. So it's not saying you can get it from your employer or you can have an individual policy like we're talking about and you can be insured through your employer with your family or you can be insured on an individual basis but everyone must carry a minimum set of if you will benefits for insurance so as a when you're saying that everybody has to be insured the flip side is that you have to be able to say to the insurance companies you can't say no to me because I have some chronic health condition or had it or because I happen to be 64 years old or I happen to be 35 years old and in the sort of pregnancy bandwidth. Insurance companies consider pregnancy, quote unquote, a disability. And you could be rated because of that. And so the very fact that you could do that, so you could say to insurance companies, look, if everybody has to be insured, that's going to be millions of people that come in and get their health care from health plans and insurance companies. But on the flip side, you're getting 5.1 million new uninsured people into your systems. So for that, widen the risk pool. You have to take everybody. You can't turn me down because of my age or medical history, and you can't rate me. You can't price my insurance product by anything but age, geographic status, and family at all. And that keeps the prices much down. Okay, what's your one reform that you'd like to see? Those were good. Um, my one reform is I actually believe that at the end of the day when we finally come up with health care reform that we move to a single payer system. I'm okay, a big advocate. And so single, single payer, payer is as opposed to universal coverage? Um, well, single payer would be universal coverage and it's just a different form of it. And it's kind of like Medicare for everyone. So you know when you turn sixty five well, that's not gonna sell people when you say it that way. Uh, well I'm with let me finish. Um, when you turn 65, you're eligible to get Medicare, which means um, the government is there. You get to choose your own doctor. You get a set of benefits. Uh, you have, right now, Medi you know, Part D Medi-Cal drugs, which isn't so good, but you have access to your, your uh, pharmaceutical needs, your labs, and everything, and it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed, and you're choosing who you go to. And I think, at the end of the day, people of all ages should be able to have basic health care coverage because I truly believe health care is a right and that if we would from day one ensure that every person who's here gets that basic right that as time goes on we will have healthier people because you'll be getting all your prevention you'll be get and you won't question it now you know I have to I don't think we're going to get there tomorrow and like any systems there's pros and cons, and no, and no system is ever going to be foolproof. But I personally think at the end of the day, that's where we need to get when, now, and when we talk about universal health Okay, now talk to our students here. Most of them are about 20, 21. They have to, when they're registered here at Loyola Marymount University, have insurance. Either they're covered by their parents or, or we charge them 400 bucks for the year, which is actually really good. Good, yeah, yeah can very, I enroll? Mm -hmm. No. Um, okay. When Someone they, want to tell us the benefits yeah. associated with $400? It's actually pretty good. What happens, though, and, and I'm assuming because most of them don't end up getting sick, you know, right. or that they report it. They don't, you know, the, what happens on, you know, Friday and Saturday morning is not reportable, so they don't. Uh, but anyway, on, uh, so when they graduate, they'll be 21, okay? 
they won't have LMU insurance anymore. They probably won't be covered by their parents' insurance because they're over 21, okay? So they will not have insurance when they graduate. That's your graduation present, by the way. You will not have health insurance. Now, your options then is to get a job that has health insurance, but most people will be um, actually hired by small companies of 50 or less, which either have no health insurance or very limited, right? Or they can buy some type of policy. So what, what's your uh, recommendation on uh, when they graduate and we give them that diploma and take away their health insurance? Well, and I think you've just hit on a very important thing. You know that right now, so much of health insurance is tied to jobs. So if you don't have a job that has health insurance, you're kind of in big trouble. The other thing I, I want to say, uh, two other things is first, for many of, of you when you graduate, the reality is, and it really speaks to what Herb was talking about, about the importance of the pool, because you will knock on wood, the majority of you be very healthy for many more years. And so um, it is kind of important that not only you have insurance so that you stay healthy, but that the pool has healthy people and, and non-healthy people, well, people that have um, higher costs mm -hmm. needed. So, um, so it is important that we come up with a way for them to be able to afford health care on their own when they're working in a small business and and that was one of the things you know that Herb talked about and it is actually was something that the governor put in his plan and I do believe will be put in national reform at least at the first step that there will be um, insurance products that will be a little less money that will give you some basic health care that won't be tied to your job that you probably can pay whether your employer pays it because they're getting tax credits so they can afford it or you're going to get some tax credit or some subsidy but that's really what we need it would be it's a shame I mean it's a shame that not only do you come out of school some of you with some significant debt right because you know some of you might have some significant debt and then suddenly you don't have any health care so it's, it's that's, that's backwards it just doesn't make sense do you mind if I make a few comments? Please. Okay, I was waiting for him to ask me the, the sort of difference between single payer and that. I, I mean, I think the one thing that's extraordinary that I think Abby's sort of illustrating, because we both come up here as sort of, you know, West Hollywood advocates, politicians, and um, healthcare reform supporters, is that you can support that same goal of universal coverage and have either one, a different way to approach it, either single payer or like the governor and the president and Fabian said when he was speaker, the Democratic speaker, um, that um, it's a mixture of public and private coverage. How would Medicaid that work? Medicaid for those who are, you know, lower income. Medicare for those who are of the senior population over 65 or if you're disabled. Um, and then a whole, the individual coverage we talked about uh, and the sort of employer-based coverage that we talked about. But, but what I sort of wanted to say there is two, two things that I think came out of this. One is that the governor's plan and the plan that is likely to go through Congress, right, is going to be a mixture of public and private insurance. What the White House has said, what Melody Barnes, the, governor, uh, the president's domestic policy advisor, has said is if we were starting from ground zero, she's told audiences, they would probably go and advocate a single-payer system. Uh, but we're not starting from ground zero. And um, it's important to sort of give this one fact that, that Abby will drive Abby nuts, but I'm going to use her mother as an example because she's right here in from Massachusetts. And when Abby mentioned Medicare before, and I went... Abby's not allowed to go across town without her mother. That's why she's That's here. Why she's here. Um, you know, Medi Medicare is not a perfect system. N nothing is. Right. Okay, nothing is. But in California, how many of you are interested in corrections, public safety, those types of issues? All of you follow the fact that we have a federal receiver with a judge that basically runs our health care system for 172,000 prisoners? Okay, that's because we can't manage it. We have six and a half million people on Medi-Cal in this state and the people in that department work very very hard but that system doesn't work and so I think Abby's correct it's not going to happen I don't know that it's going to happen now but the important thing when we said that health care reform is not a Republican or a Democratic thing every member of the assembly in 2006 voted in favor of a single-payer health reform bill 
that the governor vetoed. And then every member, Democratic member of the assembly, voted for the public-private bill that the governor and Fabian did, much with some distaste on both sides, but where the governor and Fabian stood up, they said, we're not going to wait on this problem. Fabian said, I want a single-payer system, but we have Governor Schwarzenegger for three more years. And so are we going to let 5.1 million people stay uninsured because I can't get exactly the system I want? What I really want is universal coverage. And ultimately, did it go through? No. But if you think about the same people that voted for single-payer, voted for the combination of public and private insurance. By the way, I hope you do have coverage now through your parents or even through the school coverage because out of the amount of people, the, the 5.1 that are uninsured, two to two and a half of them are what we call invincibles. 18 to 34 year olds that would rather go skiing and feel like they could never get sick than afford insurance. And so it's not true when you hear that everyone that doesn't have insurance is poor and can't afford it. A substantial part of it are probably you, and there's a lot of parents I've talked to across the country that say, I bought my child an individual policy. They don't know it, but God forbid should something happen to them, I bought it for them. So um, you are going to have to get your own insurance, and every day we wait, the system gets worse, and it's getting more expensive and getting more expensive not only for us but for you. And, you know, I think uh, Herb, Herb makes a point. I think, you know, when you're kind of trying to change policy and change the world, you have to know where you want to go and what you want the ultimate project, po product to be. And so I certainly support single payer. But along the way, you might not get there right away. And so what do I want? I want to have everyone have health insurance. So how can we get there? And I believe there's, you know, there's different steps. And as Herb said, last year, many people, many people wanted single payer, but they also wanted to, you know, they w weren't sure that would happen then. So there were other alternatives. And I think you have to be willing to do that. You know, incremental, we're talking about changing an entire system and a dysfunctional system most places. Most states, every state is facing the same issues we are. Um, every county is facing it. And so it's dysfunctional all over. And, and we have to take whatever steps we can to change it. And we, but we shouldn't not take steps because it's broken. You know, we have to look at how we fix it. I, I think it's not fair to say, well, you know, we don't manage this well, so we shouldn't do that. No, we have to keep looking at how we can manage this well so we can do that. But we've got to be willing to take the steps. So I'm going to ask two more questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to students to start asking questions. Um, what a relief, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, both of the questions are going to be tough for Abby, so I'm not going to do them for her. Okay. How do you explain that our population in LA County has increased, yet the number of hospitals that we have have decreased dramatically. What, what, what's happening there? How, how could that be? Money. I mean, but how many hospitals that we, we have something like 20% less hospitals in Los Angeles County than we did 20 years ago, I and 20% more people? Yeah, I think around 60 across the state have gone out, and probably 9 or 10 in LA County. How, where are people going for hospital care? They're going to, um, they're going to safety net clinics. They're going to um, little clinics sometimes in stores. They're going to neighborhood rooms. Or, or, uh, urgency clinics. And many of them are going to emergency rooms, which is perpetuating the problem. It's why a number of those hospitals closed, because they can't afford. They're going, you, you know, you go to the emergency room when you have an accident. You go to the emergency room, you know, when, when you're having a heart attack. You go, to the, you go to the emergency room when you're having your baby. I mean, you, that, that's what the emergency room is for. It's not when you just have a stomach ache or it's not when, you know, you really need to just go to the doctors because you have an airache. That's when you go to the doctors. But there's not enough, you know, places for people to go, so they go to the emergency room. And part room. of that we should mention is there's a federal law that's called EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment uh, Act. And that says that any person in the United States, documented or undocumented, 
can go to a hospital emergency and be screened for an emergency. If an emergency exists, they must be stabilized before they can be transferred to another facility. So there's a couple of fallacies that only people who are uninsured or underinsured, which is a big problem, go to the emergency room. Not true. You wake up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, something's wrong with your baby, maybe they're colicky, but you're worried it's something worse, you just go to your nearest emergency room. And so this is what results in, as we said, much, much, much debt for hospitals because you get the uninsured that go to the hospitals that have no coverage, they get charged, and then we end up paying it throughout the system, but the hospital has debt, substantial debt on their books. So we can't change the EMTALA law, that's a federal law. What the governor would say is, we need federal immigration reform, which is something that the president is now about to tackle, because if we were able to deal more effectively with our immigration issues, you wouldn't have as many undocumented people walking into an emergency room. But documented people or people that have insurance should not be using the emergency rooms when there's a cold, when there's a flu. I mean, how many of you? I mean, you know, I, I admit it all the time. I mean, have I been sick in my life where, uh, you know, I work in Sacramento and I live in Los Angeles and I'm just like, what do I do when the emergency clinic's closed? I used to sit in a hospital emergency room. That's crazy. So let me ask you one last question before I turn it over to the students. You were the acting secretary for labor and workforce under Gray Davis. That's part of his cabinet. Yes. And now you work closely with uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in terms of his um, uh, senior advisor. Talk about the different styles in terms of when you met and talked to both of them in terms of policy, not just health, but just in general, and their general approach to policy, politics, and, and uh, interacting with the, the legislature, and just doing policy. Okay. Um, uh, two very, very, very different styles of leadership. Um, Gray Davis um, is a very bright man, as is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Gray, um, when we had opportunities to sit down with him, to brief him on a policy issue, um, it was pretty standard, and it was a one-pager issue, background, status, and if there was a recommendation. I once had... But it could have been three to five pages, too, as a no, policy, no? No, hmm. no, no. Okay. No, I once took a 300-page state audit, and thank God I had really, really talented people working with me put it in one page on the workers' comp system. I got it to five and started crying and asked one of my colleagues to help me. Um, but he would sit in meetings and sort of look at it, think about it, and could recall, especially when he was lieutenant governor, controller, whether he dealt with similar issues. And sort of you use that to make a decision. But it was very much, I think, limited to that. Gray's very moderate. And Gray used to have an expression for his leadership style my incremental approach to governing. And that was because Pete Wilson was successful, I think, in, in, in you know, sort of governing that way, although I was, I'll, I'll leave it at that. that. That's what's recognized, okay, is that, that he had a governorship that was incremental. Same for George Duick Magian, who was before him. So with Gray, that's sort of the way it was. It was an incremental approach to governing, and he was very hands-on in terms of, in, in a lot of ways, micromanagement. And I don't use that as a negative word, but that was the style. The first time I ever sat down with Arnold Schwarzenegger to talk about potential options for his health care reform program, very, very different style. Um, you do write a briefing. It can be three pages. Oh, good. It's done a little bit differently, um, but he may or may not look at it before you come and chat about stuff. He takes it all in. He's very, very verbal. In the gray days, we sort of went and talked about the issues, and then we went in and said, okay, Governor, here's the recommended position. With Arnold that first time, Schwarzenegger, we went through the dialogue and when we had differences, 
he would actually say, well, Herb, let me hear what you say, or Kim, let me hear what you say. Is that Kim um, Belche? Yes, Kim Belche, um, our Secretary of Health and Human Services, which I realized was because of his background as an actor and how verbal he is and takes it in, he wants to be able to understand very quickly both sides of an argument, regardless of what he decides. And so his thinking is very, very big comprehensive approach to health care reform. Very, very big, and let me hear those issues. We once briefed him about health care options, got into a substantive debate about, you know, some of us think this, some of us think that. He made his decision and then walked out to do a press conference and talked, and somebody said to him, but why don't you think about this governor? He said, I've heard that, and here are the reasons why I don't you know, and that was 10 minutes later. And so his style is much bigger. It's much more verbal. He will read what you give him. And so when you come back, you better be prepared because he's probably read it. But he remembers what you talked about and you pick it up from there. And so it's, 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 it's big versus incremental. Um, but from a policy standpoint, very similar on a lot of issues. In very terms of their, of the In road. terms of their ideology. Yeah, or in terms of the, the ideology the is very similar. The uh, style of governing, the leadership style, the ability to, um, you know, work with people, to articulate, to decide how you are on an issue, um, very different. And but he has many of the same Davis people. His chief of staff was uh, Governor Davis's chief of staff. You were no Governor, Governor Davis's Davis cabinet secretary. Cabinet secretary. You you worked for both. It's sort of like you understand why Republicans are a little bit like he's not really a Republican. I mean. He surrounds himself, number one, he lives with a Democrat, Maria Shriver. Number two, he surrounds himself with a bunch of Democrats in terms of governing. I mean, he Listen, the, the entire team is made up of, it's not, it's not all of that. I think that's the, the public myth. Mm -hmm. um, yes, when he came into office and Gray was recalled and I was in the cabinet, there were a lot more you know, people that had worked and were talented that had worked with Pete Wilson. But as the administrations folded out, if you have to put labels on it, our team, the healthcare team, and the whole team in general, in terms of us on the senior staff of the governor, everything from liberal Democrat to conservative Republican. The chief of staff is a Democrat, the cabinet secretary is a moderate Republican, the cabinet is Democrats and Republicans. Uh, you know, some of my fellow, um, uh, you know, senior team members are Republicans. So just because you have Susan Kennedy or me who served Gray Davis, the greatest thing that Gray Davis ever taught me was two days after the recall, he had a cabinet meeting. And he looked at all of us and he said, this isn't about me. It's not about you. The people of this state made a decision and I want you to do everything you can in the next five weeks to make sure that the Schwarzenegger people know exactly what they need to know about what issues are facing us, et cetera, et cetera. And that attitude, I think, is what personally sort of inspired me, you know, to continue and to stay at a time when many of my Democratic friends said, traitor. Your governor was just recalled. Why are you staying and running the Employment Development Department? Well, I stayed because the governor signed the Family and Medical Paid Family um, Leave Act, the first paid family leave act in the country. And I had the opportunity, after overseeing its enactment, to oversee its implementation as the CEO of the Employment Development Department. That was what I wanted to do with the governor for the people of California, not you know, go, well, I'm taking my marbles and going home because they said Gray is not who we want now for governor. Okay. All right. Welcome back to Loyola Marymount University in the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles and Channel 36. Uh, let's have some questions from the audience. Uh, identify yourself and let's hear what you have to say. Hi, I'm Jacob, I'm senior here. Um, I think it'd be hard to find someone in here that doesn't support universal health care for everybody, but could you guys talk a little bit more about the actual cost that would be of implementing universal health care, both in implementation and once maintaining it, or the drawbacks of that, things like that? Yeah, how much is it going to cost? Are my taxes going to go up? I'm already paying for health care, 
in terms of uh, my pay deduction and all, all that kind of stuff. So how much more is this going to cost me? Well, I think if, you know, if it's done right, it's not going to cost you any more. Uh, you know that again, many see, people say government never does anything right. No. You know, I'm in government. I think we do a lot of things right. And um, there are sometimes things aren't right. And I think it depends kind of what kind of health care you're going to get. And as we said, we don't know quite sitting here today what what's ultimately going to be passed by Congress or what might be passed up at the state level. It's hard to know. But I think what we're going to try to do is look at how we can have cost containment, how we can make sure for folks who are on a fixed income uh, can afford health care, be it through a subsidy, uh, et cetera. And for folks who, you know, in, in some ways our system, if you're very, very poor, you sometimes have access to, to health care because you qualify for Medi-Cal and, and maybe some of the government programs. But when you're right in the middle, you know, you're not, you're barely getting by, but you're not poor enough to qualify. Those are the people that are often right now getting left out. And those are the people that we have to ins make sure uh, that when health care reform comes down the pike, that, that they get to afford it. Uh, two quick things. One is the governor and now the president um, both believe in the concept of what we call shared responsibility. And what shared responsibility is, and it's a term that was termed here in California during our debate, it means that everybody must contribute towards the system. And so we're looking at a health care delivery system that wouldn't be a part of the budget. You sort of put it over here, and the major types of funding actually come from the hospital community. They come from businesses who decide they don't want to provide insurance or can't, so therefore they contribute a little to the pool to make sure that other people can. So when you do bring that overall cost down, you are able to extend coverage to more people and, quite frankly, make it more affordable for those that, that have it um, right now. But that shared responsibility concept is not something, if you will, that uh, came very easily. If you said at the beginning of this healthcare debate, would um, you know health plans support a requirement that they can't uh, you know risk select people out because of their age or medical history? If you ask businesses, would they agree to a minimum contribution for health care? If you asked hospitals, would they tax themselves four percent uh, in order to achieve that? All those answers would have been no. But the great thing that happened in California is all those answers were yes. And that's what we're trying to pass on to the federal government. Mm. Next question. Identify yourself. Hello. My name is Chris, and I'm a senior urban studies major here. Um, first, I'd like to thank you both for coming. Um, one of the themes about the reform that you're talking about is a very comprehensive um, rethink of health health care. And I'm wondering um, in what role and in what is the discussion concerning undocumented workers and health care in California since undocumented workers are such a big part of our formal and informal economies. And you spoke earlier about the almost symbiotic relationship between health care and the state of the economy. And, and you have briefly mentioned uh, undocumented workers. They, they certainly have to be taken into account in anything that we do because if you completely ignore them and leave them out of the system, you don't solve the problem. Then there's still people with emergencies going to emergency hospitals, et cetera. I mean, I, I, I as I said, in, in your I clinic, believe, you guys don't ask about status or anything of that. I believe health care is a right, and I believe, quite honestly, it makes sense to make sure everyone who is here is healthy uh, because you need to. It's your community. And uh, I think regardless of documented or undocumented, we have a right to make sure people are healthy. Uh, some studies have shown that uh, some, of the, uh, some of the costs are exaggerated, that they did a study last year, and I'm so sorry that I just can't quote um, who did it and, and the exact figures, but it showed Go ahead, make that, it up. Yeah, I'm going to. Um, no. <laughs> but it, 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 that study particularly showed that there was a, that the undocumented did not use as many resources as people thought, and that also many folks who are undocumented are actually paying into the system. You know, they might be using uh, false IDs, et cetera, and, you know, that's a whole other discussion, but they're actually paying into the system. So I thought that was very interesting, and I think that takes away a little bit of uh, kind of the hysteria about it. But honestly, wouldn't you rather know that everyone, everyone here, 
as, he as um, health care. When you go to the restaurant, everyone has health care. Um, when you're at the nursery school, everyone has health care. Wouldn't you rather know that everyone has access to ensure that they're healthy? You know, it's an incredibly controversial debate. And when you look at the polls in California, you know, 20 percent are for, you know, immigration reform, 20 percent don't want to see benefits for the undocumented and you know 60 percent is in the middle and depending on how it's it's done and so the governor took flack from both the left and the right because the right wanted him to say no undocumented could ever get coverage and the first thing the doc the the governor said is every child in california shall be have health care documented or not and he took flack for a lot of people and quite frankly it was in his plan before it was ever in a democratic plan and it was a Republican governor that said, all kids. Um, and on the other side, the left was like, well, I think you should just forget about federal, you know, federal this, federal that, treat everybody the same, and the state just has to find the way to pay for it because you can't use federal dollars for things like Medi-Cal uh, and other, you know, other things, except for very minor, you know, small things like emergency services. And so one, federal immigration reform is really important. But two, one of the things that we've done is we put $130 million into a program that Abby's part of that called the Early Access to Primary Care Program. And that is because for folks who are undocumented, who are going to clinics, right now, the clinics don't get any reimbursement for that if you're undocumented, don't have insurance. So it puts them in danger. Obviously, it's better if somebody is seen and not seen to try and help them in their condition. This would actually allow people to carry a card, it's not insurance, but a coverage card, the undocumented, but allow Abby's clinic to get paid for that visit um, based on that. So we tried within the system to make sure that we put more money to where we believe the undocumented get the bulk of their health care. You know, interestingly enough, the uh, majority of immigrants actually have universal health coverage in their home countries. So, for example, in Mexico, there's universal health coverage, and it's not unusual for Mexicans, when they get sick, to actually have to return to Mexico where they can get coverage, or it's not unusual for them to return for medicines and things of that nature because it's obviously offered for free. So the idea that immigrants come to America to get health care couldn't be anything further from the truth. They have universal health care in Mexico and in many other immigrant-sending uh, countries. So we um, gave a tour a couple of weeks ago through... Um, the International Visitors Bureau of some healthcare providers from uh, from from South America and Central America, and they had gone to hospitals, et cetera. And you know, quite frankly, as as we were trying to explain how the clinic operates and how we pay for things and the amount of fundraising we have to do, you know, their eyes just kind of rolled, and Lays you over. were and you were embarrassed. You know, I mean, you were really embarrassed as you talk about, even though every day we know how broken our system is, when we were trying to explain kind of how broken our system was, it's, it's embarrassing. Uh, and they were kind of appalled that the richest country, you know, in, in the world is struggling and not able to provide health care for everybody. Yeah. Hi, I'm Danny. I'm a sociology senior. Thank you for coming. You've done a great job tonight talking about some of the major issues that have been directly involved in the national debate. I'd like to ask you about another set of symbiotic issues that I think maybe haven't been as prominent in the current national debate, but have been in California, especially in previous administrations, and that's tort reform and deregulation. California has been kind of a laboratory for that. We've had MICRA for some time now. That was held out as going to be something that was going to drive costs down. I'm not sure if it's done that. We've also had a lot of deregulation, which I'm sure you've been involved with being in the managed care industry, which I think <laughs> people also think about in terms of tort reform and uh, in terms of keeping medical providers accountable if they're going to be increasingly privatized. Under the current system, where we are today, not necessarily where we're going, do you think it's time to look at tort reform and deregulation in California again, especially considering what's recently happened with Blue Cross and not only questions about issuing care, but actually recognizing policies and granting benefits as opposed to canceling policies? And if we do get a single payer and universal system, will we have to completely overhaul our uh, tort and regulatory system to handle it? Well, how, will, uh, how will patients have standing to ensure they have decent care? So, Herb, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question in two sentences for us. <laughs> <laughs> do we need to uh, take another look at tort reform and deregulation in California? Are you going to law school next year? 
Okay. <laughs> I live with a lawyer. That's why I'm asking. Um, I think tort reform is, is one of the most controversial issues because if you think about it, there are caps on damages, uh, medical damages, um, and so there's this political fight between trial lawyers, consumer attorneys, people that are advocating for people who have been harmed in some way or another, uh, but the damages are limited in California through the MICRA Act. Um, and so it has always become this, um, uh, if you will, sort of warring factions between uh, the doctors uh, and the trial attorneys. And it breaks down sometimes in political lines uh, as well. Um, and that the Democrats are supportive of the trial lawyers and the Republicans of the doctors, generally. Generally, if you sort of look at it that way, but not, I, you doctors, not always, but, uh, you know, Joe Dunn, the head of the California Medical Association, former state senator, um, is uh, a trial lawyer. Uh, and is head of the medical association. I always tease him, and I'm like, which side are you on, Joe? You know, do you the talk one that, with the one yourself? That's go, him. You know, you what? The one that's paying him. That's what right. that is. Right. Well, I, that that he can speak for himself. He's a great advocate. Um, he's paid to be. He's being paid to be an advocate. <laughs> you said it. Um, so. I don't see right now, and in, in, you know, and I don't dwell in these issues day to day. I mean, when we got into the health care reform discussion, I'll tell you, um, three people in three of the 1,400 meetings that I did raised tort reform. Surprised me. I thought, you know, I, I went out in front of thousands and thousands of doctors when we were going to put a fee on doctors like we did hospitals to get more federal money. Well, the hospitals made out well and still provided money for coverage and still had money to help them not doctors, because they're not required to take everybody that comes in the door. So we dropped it, but I had enough uh, conversations with doctors about other issues so people weren't raising tort reform. You know, deregulation, you know, I, I don't know. I, I came to Sacramento on my first tour during the Davis days when um, energy deregulation and that whole thing blew up. And so I think it's sort of fairly rare these days that I hear the words deregulation. And even when you're talking about managed care, it looks like there potentially is another wave of mergers coming um, nationally. I'm not sure how it'll affect California, um, but there's also starting to be some concerns in the provider community that the plans are once again going to get bigger and then probably maybe put some, cause some impact on the balance. Uh, but I haven't seen the consumer attorneys and the doctors getting into that discussion this year. He had a second part of it, though, on single payer. On single payer, I think uh, there was a bill last year from uh, Senator Sheila Kuehl for SB 840, and there was a whole component there that dealt with quality of care and patients' rights, et cetera. And I think whatever system <coughs> comes, there's a new bill uh, up in Sacramento by Mark Leno, I believe. Same number. And is it the same number? And again, there'll be a portion in there and through, through you know, the process. But it's critical that whatever system comes, that that people have, you know, uh, an avenue to to um, to to assess and make sure that they're getting the kind of care that they want, and that there's a process for that, and that there has to be a rigorous process to ensure that there's quality. Thank you, uh, Arash. Hi, uh, my name's Arash. I'm a business major, senior. Uh, my question was kind of mixed with like oversight, and uh, you mentioned it earlier with the cost of healthcare, um, and it's through, through my own personal experience. Uh, last year, I had a uh, temperature that went over 102. I had to go to an emergency room. They gave me ibuprofen at $25 a pill. I mean, you could buy 25 of those for like $4 over the counter. Just last week, I got a uh, food poisoning. Again, I had to go to an emergency room. Uh, my antibiotics cost over $300 for eight pills. And I'm just like, I'm lucky to have insurance, but I'm also an independent student. Therefore, I don't work. I mean, I'm just going to school, you know, living in my uh, parents' house and uh, getting along with whatever I can get. Uh, so I'm just wondering, does the government trying to put some sort of oversight into hospitals charging these kinds of stuff to patients? I mean, we're talking about regular people with insurance still getting like, you know, my, pill, my next bill for this uh, last week will probably come from 500 to $1,000. And I'm just wondering, is there any oversight for, uh, for hospitals and private companies charging these like crazy amount of money 
where you could get these pills for like 10 bucks a pill, five bucks a pill in like India, Iran, Mexico, you know. Yeah, but the air fare would cost you a lot. <laughs> uh, I could just have this ship too, you know, I mean, it comes down so, to it. Thank I you. love these personal anecdotes because collectively yeah. they do make up what the story is and you talk, I mean, people are constantly saying, wait a minute, I saw the, my hospital bill, why does that Tylenol cost so much or um, that, that medicine? I mean, what, what's going on? I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of, Herb said it uh, earlier, that oftentimes it's those that can least afford it are being charged the, the full fare, if you would, and there's been a lot of discussion, certainly in Sacramento, about kind of looking at how to change that because it doesn't make sense and it certainly doesn't make sense it's why you know people um, declare bankruptcy when they've had uh, an illness that's put them in the hospital or, or some kind of chronic disease because you just can't afford it yeah you or if can't. you have a son and like him who's sick every uh, week right, yeah. I know. we need to talk to your parents but no but it he is, needs to get into prevention and wellness right, and we're going to talk right. with you about that yeah. and don't tell and tell us all later where you ate but um but I think it is that, you know, it's the drug companies, look, everyone deserves a profit. You've, you know, worked, a business major. Of course you want companies to have a profit, but kind of at, at what cost? Now, I admit I am an incredibly liberal Democrat. You know, I fall way over on the left. Really? Um, we couldn't pick I, it up. Yeah, I mean, so, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, shocked by the yeah, that news. So, sorry, I'm glad you were <laughs> sitting. But, uh, but with that said, I mean, people deserve, you know, they've worked a profit, but at what cost? That's outrageous that, you know, one ibuprofen was $25. That's, that's, that's just not right. And it's why, unfortunately, people are going to uh, Mexico or Canada and getting their prescriptions. And I know that uh, uh, the governor and actually the president, they've talked about looking at... Is that why the president is in Mexico getting his prescriptions right now? <laughs> I guess that's what he's doing. But uh, <laughs> let me rephrase. Uh, okay. But, I mean, part of... Uh, Thank God it's not live. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, uh, but I think, you know, that was one of the things that the governor was looking at is how do we change the cost of those pharmaceuticals and looking at different ways of importing or also, quite honestly, having government purchase. You know, we're the biggest purchaser. If we were purchasing in bulk, perhaps um, right. that would change uh, the cost of some of these. And things. these are, these are, are far more, um, and, and I think Abby correctly points that out. I mean, these are far more when it gets into antitrust um, it gets into federal issues around pricing and some of the things. And so one of the things, because, you know, as a moderate Democrat, um, you know. Uh, Compared to Abby. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> correct. Just remember, Gavin Newsom in San Francisco is not considered a liberal, and the rest of the state he is. Um, I, I mean, you know, labels are labels, right. but, you know, they, they're really, in a lot of ways, very, very meaningless. Um, I think that the, the point that I wanted to make is that one of the things that we talked about in health care reform, because there are all issues about, you know, um, you know, why don't we don't support, you know, quote unquote, price controls, um, because there are things you can do. The Veterans Administration has the most incredible buying power, Medi-Cal, right? Medi they don't have the buying power that, that our, our veterans get. Uh, but that's what drug manufacturers have done in terms of working with the government. So some of the discussion is, do you ensure that best price, not meaning Medi-Cal price, but meaning, you know, buying into the same thing the vets do. But what we did in California, which is sort of taking off and, and against initially the resistance of the health plans, is that you are right, there's an issue of overall administrative expenses and profit versus dollars, you know, money that goes into patient care and patient care services. And so in the governor's reforms, there's what we call an 85% rule, a medical loss free issue. How much do you spend on this? Now, the state loosely had this rule already for HMOs, but it dealt with administrative expenses, salary, admin. In health reform, it also was profit. And so we said, okay, you're entitled as a private sector entity or a nonprofit health plan to have a profit, to be able to do whatever, but it's going to be limited to 15% administration and profit to make sure that most of the money goes to patient care, which part of that is also to ensure that providers, especially doctors and hospitals, got paid more, which is an issue that impacts access when our payment rates are so low. So you're right. I mean, you could do it with different strategies, 
Um, I'm just proud that some of the things that people would say are democratic concepts were promoted by our governor where we had Democrats and Republicans now nationally and in California supporting, you know, when, when you say, oh, you're supporting a, a limit on the profits and the admin and three of the biggest health plans in the state as a part of a comprehensive plan supported it. Herb, can you give us a little What's bit of What's your major? What class are you in? <laughs> You're not a senior, are you? Uh -oh. I'm from Westchester High School. And I'm <laughs> auditing this class. Um, I just have, have a quick question about sin taxes, okay. which is what uh, some, a lot of states and counties put on alcohol. My cigarettes. sins or um, other people's sins? Everyone's sins. Whatever's going to make yeah. the most money. Okay. Right. The, the question is, how effective are these sin taxes in, in providing programs that uh, help uh, free clinics and other organizations. Uh, do they help dissuade people from buying alcohol and smoking cigarettes? And is that a reliable tax revenue stream uh, for for governments and other organizations? Uh, I'm explain, gonna, explain the sin tax and how much revenue generally we get from that. Cigarettes, liquor, whether it's beer, whether it's distilled spirits, um, you know, gambling, you know, soda, uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, there's oftentimes sort of a nexus, if you will, uh, around some of these uh, types of taxes and programs that go for reduction in smoking, that go for reductions in uh, alcohol usage, um, in drinking soda. You know, we've pulled all the sodas out of the, you know, the schools and, 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 and the like. Big debate about it because even though a lot of the advocates on, on sort of the, the advocates of sort of comprehensive reform agree that people should stop smoking and you can do an increased uh, cigarette tax to promote dollars going into um, uh, you know smoking reduction programs so there's a direct linkage there's also some data that people point to and say yes but when you do that you get less smokers which means you have less revenue so the way to pay for all of this becomes more squishy, if you will. And so, for example, some people during health care reform uh, advocated quite strongly for a sales tax because it applies across the board as opposed to a tax that hits specifically like we had in health reform a $1.75 increase per pack of cigarettes. Cigarette industry obviously didn't like it. We're very opposed to it. We were trying to negotiate. They may have accepted it at a lower amount. I still think we would have gotten there regardless, but um, it is something like that. So we talk about now whether you put a tax or a fee on sodas and whether that then is more reliable than a cigarette tax or, uh, or that. But a lot of people seem to think that uh, a cigarette tax is not as reliable as a sales tax. But you have to think of this. Unfortunately, with a $42 billion budget deficit, we've just raised taxes in the state. We've cut services in the state. Um, and other things are going to happen or not happen on May 19th. So that impacts if you have you know, a sales tax once, do you do another sales tax six months later? So it's, it's a difficult issue. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, no one likes to talk about taxes, and, and it is a difficult issue. But I think when we're looking at health care specifically and what uh, you know, what you can be doing. Having people smoke less um, improves people's health. Um, taking away sugary sodas improves people's health. We know there's a tremendous cost associated with people who drink and drive and uh, those impacts. So putting taxes as a way to dissuade and provide programs, though it's a bit counterintuitive, it kind of may be one of the few places that we have. And you're right, as we stop smoking, there's less revenue. But you've also stopped people from smoking. Uh, so it's, it's not a perfect answer. But as we're struggling to look at how to close a tremendous budget gap and how to make sure that people get the services they need, I think you have to look at these. Hey, let's give our guest to Loyola Marymount University. Thank you. Thank you.